Hey there everybody, Steve the Amateur Historian. On my way home from an absolutely necessary trip to the store, but I prepared accordingly. So, it's about a month ago when I did another trip like this to the store, I felt like there was somebody following me, and maybe it was just the paranoia of not wanting to be near people in these times, but I thought someone was like following me, and I kind of quickly went around the corner and was like, okay, all right, I'm okay now. And when I just left just now, I thought I heard like footsteps kind of rapidly coming up behind me. I turned around and there was nothing there. But I felt like that kind of set the stage for a perfect opportunity to start another episode in my um, mystery murder series. Um, this is a case I recently found, didn't know I was going to do it so early, but that reminded me of a particular aspect of this, of this um, story. is the idea of someone feeling like they were being followed by someone who scared them, although it's under much more sketchy and I'll be blunt and keep your interest now racist circumstances in the case of this story. And you know, most of the videos that I've done in this series, there's web sleuth pieces where people, you know, discuss on online forums about, you know, what, what might have happened in this mystery case or that mystery case, or, you know, there's historians have written a couple of things that you can find, or there's a YouTube video or two, or you know, blogging sites that focus in on stuff like this. Uh, you know, usually you find something at least in one of those avenues in relation to a case, and in this case, nothing. I did a, f after, I only, the only information that I could find on this case was old newspaper articles, and I stumbled onto this case by absolute chance. I was looking up something completely different, and they referenced this case. And when I first saw the reference, I was like, I don't even know what that is. So I started looking into it, and I found a bunch of old articles from the months surrounding when this event happened. I've never seen, in, in like an extensive research, didn't find any Google results, YouTube videos, blogs, forums, anything besides these old newspaper articles talking about this case. So this is a case that's about as obscure as it gets and it takes us back to 1912. Made it home, everybody. Safe and hopefully sound. Or I guess hopefully safe and sound. But um, hopefully that little intro I did while walking around with the mask over my face, which I've noticed has kind of started leaving this indent mark on my nose that I do not care for. Uh, hopefully that little mysterious intro kind of whetted your whistle. Me uh, talking about the, um, especially in this time of quarantine, the nerves of like walking along and feeling like there's someone coming behind you. So you look back, and sometimes there's nobody there, but sometimes there's someone there. And as you will see in, the, in my telling of this particular story, that that um, type of an eyewitness account actually played a pretty significant role in the story. While I don't buy a lot of it, it's um, a similar thing like that happened, but in this case it was pretty, pretty disgusting. Um, but this case does take us back over 100 years. It takes us back to 1912. And 1912... No matter what part of America you were living in, it was a different time. And just because it wasn't the deep south, it doesn't mean that people weren't super racist. And that said, I also want to drop another little disclaimer to just express because I've developed a pretty strong opinion in terms of who I think is responsible for the crime in this case. So I'll tell you right now, if you're a you know moderately religious person, the conclusions I reach might piss you off. And if you're a super devout religious person, or at least, you know, Christian, this video and my conclusions are probably really gonna piss you off. But, you know, I try to cut out any biases and anything like that comes along, and I try to just look at the evidence, whatever I can get, and draw a proper conclusion based on the evidence. And if there's not enough evidence there, I'll make that clear. So this story, again, I found at random. I was looking up an article, I was looking up a different killer in a different case, and I found an article about multiple killers who were being put to death in 1912. And they quoted one of the killers, you know, before he went up to be hung, um, discussing it. And he said, you know, whatever I did, 
you know, it couldn't have been bad as, you know, whoever did that thing to that green girl in Eugene. And this was a 1912 paper, so immediately I'm like, what girl, what green girl in Eugene? Be meaning Eugene, Oregon. Um, and so I looked up, and fortunately, because I, I didn't have a first name, I just typed in 1912 Eugene Green Murder, hoping to find something. And I did. So... It was August 20th, 1912, and it is believed during the early morning hours, uh, authorities pinpointed it around 4 a.m., 12-year-old Mildred Green, who lived in, kind of smack dab in the middle of Eugene with her father, who was a reverend. He was a Reverend H. Green. I'll just call him Reverend Green from now on. And they were living alone in this, this uh, small house that had an upstairs, but the upstairs was pretty much just um, Mildred's bedroom. And sometime during the night, someone went into her bedroom and slit her throat from ear to ear. So a very, I mean, having your throat slit is a troubling, disgusting thing, no matter your age. But the fact that this was a 12-year-old girl that this happened to makes it all the more worse. And this, again, is a case that, aside from the newspaper articles I found from back in 1912, I have found nothing else online that has ever referenced this case. And as far as I can tell, this is still a cold case. The murder of 12-year-old Mildred Green has never been solved. And in my research, I found a lot of papers from 1912. And then by 1913, the stories just faded off as there was obviously no more suspects, nothing to go on. And after about a year goes by, or two, you know, cases fade, other big events happen, and locals kind of start to forget or stop being as angry as they were when the case first happened. And I researched this case, trying to find results on a you know, newspaper database going all the way up into like the 50s and found nothing. So this case kind of just faded away by 1913, which is really tragic. And it's just another, um, unfortunately, in a string of unsolved murder cases. And by the father, Reverend Green's account, the night before the murder, so it would be August 19th, he and his daughter Mildred, because they lived alone by this time, uh, spent a leisurely evening um, at home. They obviously said their prayers. He said that she played the piano a little bit while he sat and read. They both went to bed at 10 p.m. approximately. And when they went to bed, she asked him specifically to wake her up early the following morning because she wanted to help him do chores, specifically the laundry. But when the Reverend woke up at... By his account, 6.30 a.m., he decided to let her sleep in a little bit. So he started um, getting the clothes ready to do the laundry. They apparently had some farm animals. He went out to the barn and did some of that work. And by 8 a.m., he finally decided to go up and wake up Mildred. He went to the base of the staircase because, again, there was a small stairway that went up to a second floor, and pretty much all that was on the second floor was Mildred's bedroom. It was a very tiny second floor area. He called out to her and there was no response and he didn't even have to go up the stairs you know all the way before he could peer. Her door was cracked open and he saw her lying on her bed in a pool of blood presumably surrounding her head and shoulders that had j just drained out of her. And you know by this point she'd been dead for at least a couple of hours. He walked up to her. Her body was cold and he pretty much, by his account, he, he just kind of, you know, went delirious for a moment and just forgot even what he was thinking or what he did in the immediate moments after discovering his daughter dead and then ran out into the streets screaming like, you know, my daughter's dead and trying to summon um, the police to come, which of course they did. And they investigated the scene and what really struck them was there was no evidence of an intruder that had crept into the house. There was, they even said that the bedspread on Mildred's, Mildred Green's bed that she was laying on was completely undisturbed. Almost like she, she wasn't even laying on it, which of course she was. There was no fingerprints found in her room or anywhere in the house that could belong to some outside perpetrator. There was no footprints, discernible kind of footprints 
that they could pick up from the interior of the home. There was no prints going to or leaving the house. It was determined that whoever the um, perpetrator was, he or she had snuck in through the back door of the home, which consisted of a screen door and then there was another door that, that was, there was like, you know, the main door to go through, which apparently had glass window panes, one of which was broken. Now, Reverend Green said that he locked both those doors. He always locked those doors. And he didn't, he didn't know, like he said, you know, there was a broken glass in the, the interior door, so someone could have reached through that and unlocked that door. So that's understandable. But the screen door had been unlocked. It hadn't been broken into. So obviously the door wasn't uh, locked, at least by the time the perpetrator got there. And Reverend Green theorized that. He said that Mildred had a tendency of waking up in the middle of the night and kind of going downstairs and opening the back door and kind of stepping outside for a moment, I guess, to get a breath of 3 a.m. fresh air. Whether that's fact or not, who knows? That's just what the Reverend said. And so he felt that she probably, you know, half asleep did that and then went back inside and forgot to lock the back door, went back upstairs and went back to sleep. Now, this again was a very small house and the way it was structured was Mildred would go up to her bedroom, which was this little room up here, and the Reverend's room was directly beneath hers. So pretty much, and again, this is 1912, it's a little old, simple wood house. You know, you have stairs that I guarantee you creaked. You have floorboards that I guarantee creaked a little bit. What home didn't have that? I mean, most homes still have it today, but back then, trust me. So it's really bewildering that the Reverend, the father, didn't hear anybody break in, didn't hear anybody go upstairs, even though the stairs would have been right next to his room, and didn't hear anybody go into Mildred's room directly above him, didn't hear Mildred supposedly come down and step out back for a moment before going to bed, didn't hear a struggle that would have likely ensued, because, I mean, you think if someone came in and just slit Mildred Green's throat while she was asleep, well, it's, slitting your throat isn't like your whole body explodes where you die instantaneously. Your throat gets cut and you're, you know, all of a sudden you're struggling and you know, eventually you're like, there would have been some motion, some struggle, something. Um, it, it, there would have been at least a little bit of a struggle. There would have been at least a little bit of ruffling of Mildred Green's bedding and yet there was none of this. This person just crept in, slit her throat, and crept out without leaving anything behind. It was practically the perfect crime because there was no evidence uh, for who this person could have been. There was more evidence outside of the house than inside. And when I say that, I mean there were two people in the, in the, you know, the immediate aftermath of these reports of Mildred Green being murdered. There were reports of two different men in the middle of the night that night that were seen running in certain parts of town. One was reported as a white man running down the street, uh, I believe a few blocks away from the Green home. And then there were reports of a black man who was also seen running in the vicinity of a post office. Now they didn't give a location or an address of that post office, so I don't know how close that was to the Green home, but there were reports of people running in the night, and so you think, well, maybe that was the perpetrator fleeing the scene. and. Um, a little ways after the crime happened, there was a man who worked on the railroad who was up in Roseburg, who had just recently, that night, um, had been in Eugene, and the train that he was running pulled out of uh, the station there in Eugene not long after, or it was like during the night, so it could have been right around the time that Mildred Green was killed, and he said that as they were leaving, he saw a black man racing towards the train, like trying to hop on board, and he didn't quite make it, so the train left him behind, and we don't know what happened. And this is where we get into the notion of the person walking along and thinking somebody's following them from behind, because it became um, a major focus, and of course this is 1912 America. So if you have a brutal crime and you don't have a suspect, it's real easy to just blame it on some dark-skinned person, unfortunately. 
And so because there was a report of a black man running running down the street at some point that night, and because another guy reported a black man trying to hop a train during that night, it was immediately assumed that this was the killer, and immediately an objective was made to pursue a black man as being the killer. And that unfortunately didn't, didn't really get authorities that far. They had really only two suspects that they took into custody. First, there was an H.E. Harris who was arrested towards the southern end of Eugene, who, again, was a black man, and he was found to be carrying a razor on him, and that was kind of, people, a lot of people thought because of the, you know, the way that the murder was done, it was felt that it was done with a razor of some kind. They asked Reverend Green if he had any razor like that, and he showed that they didn't have any knives in the whole house and that uh, the method he used to shave didn't match the kind of method that was used on um, Mildred Green. So whoever did this likely brought their own weapon, which you know means it was premeditated. So you're thinking, like, here's just a, a hum seemingly humble religious man and his daughter just living in their home. They're not super rich. They haven't really done anybody wrong, it seems. And someone goes to the house premeditated, they're bringing a razor of some kind with them. They creep into the house, go upstairs and murder this innocent 12 year old girl and then just wander out of the house. It, it just, it makes no sense. This is completely insane. I mean, even if they had, you know, some real weirdos in town, like it just, it was so unexpected. There was no signs that anybody took issue with the greens. There was, you know, they, they didn't know where to go with the case really because it was such an illogical disgusting murder. And here they found this guy named H.E. Harris who was carrying a razor on him. And he also had some blotches on his pants that looked like it might have been dried blood. Those pants were sent away to be analyzed to see if it was blood and when all is said and done Harris was released. So I'm assuming that it wasn't blood. And a little bit after that a man named Harry Smith was arrested in Medford. Um, good ways south of Eugene, um, who was another African-American man who reportedly had been in the Eugene area roughly around the time that Mildred Green was killed. And when he was discovered, he was carrying a uh, Colt, a Colt 45 on him. But when, it, when that was examined, it was found to have never been used. And it wouldn't be really relevant anyway because nobody shot Mildred Green. But he also was found to be carrying a razor on him. But through investigation looking into him, it was found that at the time that Mildred Green was killed, he was actually in Roseburg with several friends. So he had a uh, pretty ironclad alibi. So he was also released. And we get to a point where it's been almost two weeks since Mildred Green was murdered. A lot of local sentiment is that it was an African-American guy, but everyone that they've looked into um, aren't panning out, but there's still this 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 idea that it, that it had to have been a black man, even though, other than seeing, you know, a black man running to try to catch a train, we have no verification that Mildred Green's killer was any race distinguishable from another. But it's, you know, it's 1912, and it's been again almost two weeks since this happened and all of a sudden we get a story from a Eugene local a Mrs. S. E. Rickman who claims that uh, I believe on August was it August? I don't even remember what month this case happened again August 20th I knew it was August 20th she claimed that on August 19th, she was walking home, kind of somewhat in the vicinity of where the Greens lived. I think she said she lived a couple couple doors down. And as she was walking home, she got this feeling that somebody was following her. And she turned and looked back and saw what in her words was the most scariest, frightening, he just exploded with an aura of violence. It's like the most disgusting man she'd ever seen in her life. And he was this black man who was extremely tall with really long legs and really wide arms. She described him like he was like one of those inflatable tube characters that you see at car lots. And she was so 
stricken with fear of this man who literally was doing nothing. He was just walking behind her that she darted around the corner and ran. And she said that she spent the whole rest of the night at home quivering with fear over this man that she had just seen. A man that even by her own account, you know, she couldn't even verify if he was following her or anything. But he was this horrendously frightening black man. And it rejuvenated that sensation around town of a black man being responsible for this killing. And she claimed that she saw the guy two more times. She claimed that he saw him again as late as August 28th, eight days after the murder. And she even said, she was quoted um, as saying that pretty much the moment... You know, after seeing that guy, the moment she heard about Mildred Green's death, she was dead certain because apparently she has intuition beyond any remote human capability. She was dead certain that this wild man that she saw was the one who was guilty of killing Mildred Green and, of course, said that based on absolutely no evidence, just based on her own hyperbolic, nonsensical, racist perspective of this man that she'd never seen before. And... Yeah, she said the moment that, again, Mildred turned up dead, she thought this was the guy that did it. And yet, she didn't seem... Now, she claims that she told the police and they kind of didn't do anything about it, which I highly doubt. This was a big deal case that they wanted leads on. And then she said she apparently went to, like, higher and higher, you know, authority people in Eugene, and that was when her story finally came out. But I find it interesting that if she was so convinced, why did it take her two weeks to even hit the papers with her story? And she claimed that, you know, after seeing this guy on the 19th, the second time she saw this man was she'd, she'd woken up out of bed about 4.30 in the morning, so this would be pretty close to when Mildred Green was killed, and she just stepped outside. She just, you know, woke up randomly at 4 o'clock in the morning, or 4.30, stepped outside. And as she stepped outside, she started hearing footsteps running. And as she started looking around, she saw this black guy she saw earlier appear, and he just sprinted across the street and was making a beeline towards uh, the railroad lines, which were a few blocks north of her home. Um, and maybe this is the same guy that was seen running to jump the train that was rolling out of the station. And she claimed that this was the same guy that she had seen and that, you know, right around the time Mildred Green was killed, he was right up the street running away, presumably from the scene of the crime. Now, that's pretty strong, a pretty strong damaging eyewitness account if I had any faith in Mrs. Rickman that this was not just some exaggerated perspective on things. I very highly, I highly question what she really saw. And this was actually posted in the newspaper. Um, and let me just say, she used the N-word when they quoted her. So when I say N-word, that's me censoring the fact that she's saying the actual word. Because this is what, and, and mind you, this is uh, someone who's going to become, you know, who became a primary witness in this case. Oh, she actually saw the guy. Of course, she didn't know his name. She didn't know what happened to him. She didn't know where he was from. Her description of him was obviously exaggerated and based on, you know, absurd, you know, racial perspectives that white people had on black people. But in, and I made you, I brought my Mac in to, um, just so I could specifically read exactly what she said when describing this horrendously frightening black man. The minute I laid eyes on him, said Miss Rickman last night, I said to myself that that was no N-word to be caught up by. So I turned off the sidewalk onto a path that runs to our house and let him go on. That was her description of when she first saw the guy. I said to myself that that was no N-word to be caught up by. First of all, that's horrid ink grammar. And second of all, going on. It says, she was so impressed by the vicious appearance of the man, however, that after she got home, she could not stop thinking of him and turned around and went immediately over to the little store on the corner of Fifth and Blair to see if the, well, they don't say the N-word, but the other N-word that was more accepted at that time, had gone there to buy something, thus indicating that he had some purpose in the neighborhood. He had not entered the store, though, and was nowhere in sight. So 
the woman thought that the, the only justifiable reason why a man like that would be in my neighborhood is if he went to the store. It couldn't possibly be that he was walking to somebody's house or walking to his house or going for a walk. No, no, no. Just like, this is someone we're supposed to rely on as a credible witness in this case of the murder of a 12-year-old child. And then it, you know, it rambles on about how, you know, her, her ridiculous description of the man. But I want to say that she's quoted. Okay, yeah, so there, there are a couple more quotes from her. Um, so going on, it says, The first thing I thought of after I heard of the murder, said Miss Rickman last night, was the N-word <laughs> that I had seen that morning and I... Um, I'm sorry, I can't read that word. It's all blotched. Um, and right away to get the sheriff's office on the phone. So after she heard about the case, she went to tell the officer. And I couldn't get there. I couldn't get them all day, though. The next morning, I said to myself that this was something that the officers ought to know. So I went down to the sheriff's office and found Mr. Yeah, names messed up, so I can't read it. Um, and he came out with me, and we went over the whole situation. When I saw the N-word... The third time, I went straight to Mr. Bryson, who that was the district attorney in the area, and told him everything I knew, and he immediately detailed several officers to go over the whole case thoroughly. There have been officers here all day. And then blah, 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 more about how she's firmly convinced that this was the guy she saw. So she used the N-word twice, and it's obvious when you, when you hear the way she's talking that she was using the word in a very passive way and granted I know a lot of people still use that verbiage back then but you get why I don't exactly have a lot of faith in Miss Rickman's account and the fact that you know she she still implies that you know by the second day after it happened that she got to the district attorney about this and they went over it and yet it was two weeks after the murder before uh, before her story even hit the papers um, and it was obvious that she didn't tell them till after the 28th because she said that she saw him again. Um, so I don't even know. And there, there was another neighbor who apparently verified the story. There was another woman who, again, was rousted out of bed and randomly decided to step outside at about 4 or 4.30 in the morning and said she, you know, saw this man, saw a man running towards the railroad tracks. And I'm thinking, this is a very interesting town. This is a very interesting street where it seems everybody gets out of bed at 4 a.m. to go step outside randomly. Mrs. Rickman did. Randomly, one of her next-door neighbors did. And neither one of them said that they, like, heard the footsteps and it woke them up. They just implied that they just kind of woke up. And then even Mildred Green supposedly walked outside randomly in the middle of the night and forgot to lock the door when she went back inside. Just bizarre. And when all is said and done, we still don't know who this man was. He was never apprehended. We don't have a name, we don't have, we don't even have verification that, you know, this man that Mrs. Rickman supposedly saw was the same guy that ran to the trains, you know. By the time she told her story, it was already being widely spread that there was a man trying to, a black man trying to run and catch a train, leaving the train yard. So it would be real easy to say, oh yeah, I saw this one guy, and the last time I saw him, he was running to catch a train. And you can just automatically imply that those are the same people. So it's very strange goings on. And that wasn't the end. Because there was just a lot of strange stuff going on around Eugene at this time. And one thing is, there was apparently, like, a guy who was wandering around town um, claiming to be a guy that, like, fixed people's pans. It's like a pan repairman. And this one local guy in Eugene said that this guy showed up to try to offer his services. And he, out of nowhere, un not, not instigated at all, started rambling about how he almost had this petulant fear of young girls and how, like, everywhere he went, young girls would just, like, just, like, drape themselves on them and flirt with them incessantly. And he said that, like, some girls tried to do that and he tried to get away, but they, like, threatened to get him in trouble. And then he went, he, so he, he still fled and then he ended up meeting. It, it was like he was God's gift to women, but he was afraid of it. It was this very odd encounter. And the guy's name was never printed in papers. I don't know if he was ever identified or ever actually gave his name to anyone he visited. But, you know, in the aftermath, some people wondered, like, this guy's got a screw loose. Maybe maybe he's the killer. Who knows? And um, there was another... There were a couple other events that happened that may or may not have been perpetrated by the same 
um, at least by a potential suspect in Mildred Green's case. There was another house where there was a young girl like Mildred Green who was woken up out of her sleep in the middle of the night. This was just a couple days after the murder. And she said that she was hearing sounds outside her window and she thought that somebody was trying to get in. She woke up, ran to her parents, and they found that the screen outside her window had been loosened and there was a box sitting on the ground outside of her room like someone had stepped on it to try to get up to her, room, her bedroom window. When she got up and ran and got her parents, if there was somebody there that was trying to get in, it certainly looks like there was, whoever that person was fled the scene. Never, nobody knows who that person may or may not have been. And right in that same time period, there was a man named G.W. Billmeyer, it's a very interesting last name, who also thought that somebody was trying to break into his house. Um, he, he like saw someone lingering, he thought he heard someone trying to get in, he heard somebody out in front of his home, and with this recent presumably intruder coming in and killing a little girl, he went and grabbed <laughs> his gun and went outside and started firing shots and saw more than one man flee the scene. And it was thought maybe this was Mojo Green's killer trying to sneak into someone else's house and kill somebody. It was later determined that the man that was loitering right outside his house was actually a local farmer who'd gotten just drunk off his ass and he was riding his like cart or carriage back home to his farm and like one of the it like broke down on him and so he just decided because he's drunk as hell he decided to just try to find a spot to just sleep for the night and he picked Bill Meyer's front porch apparently to sleep on Bill Meyer heard him and chased him off and there was one more interesting little event that happened in Cottage Grove, which is a little bit south of Eugene. And another thing where I'm like, I'm just intrigued enough to wonder if maybe this guy was a legitimate suspect, but he was let go. So we'll never know. I don't even know if they got a name off of the guy, but August 30th, 10 days after Mildred Green was killed, there was a train that stopped in Cottage Grove and there was a reported hobo who I don't remember, he was, he was a, um, a black man also, so of course he was being targeted as a possible suspect. And he, he was found trying to hide on this train. And I don't know if like, they knew he was coming in on the train or if someone saw him sneak onto the train. But um, local authorities got on there and tried to catch him. And the moment they pulled a gun and said, come out, he split from the train and took off into town. And he actually barged into a woman's house. She started screaming and freaking out because, of course, a, a black man had just ran into her house. So, of course, he's probably going to do something horrible to her, white person logic. And he ended up hiding in a bedroom under a bed. And, of course, the authorities saw him run in there. They heard the woman screaming, and they ultimately found this guy under the bed. And they pulled him out, and he was shaking and gyrating and freaking out. And he also just happened to be carrying a razor on him. Maybe that was just a regular thing that people just carried razors on him back in the day. Because this is a strange, bizarre number of people that were caught um, acting odd and then dismissed who were carrying razors on them around the time that Mildred Green had her throat cut. And they said that, you know, the guy was really, you know, erratic and fearful and shaking and worried, like, oh, they're going to kill me. But he also was, like, aware, because they started questioning him about the case, and he was aware, like, what they were talking about. And yet, they just, um, they let him go, even though he was acting very strangely. It didn't seem like they even tried to detain him. Maybe they just assumed the guy, they assumed the guy was just kind of crazy, and they just decided, ugh, no, we're not digging it, because... I mean, it's not like the first investigation that let leads go away. And there was um, one of the last things. There was a guy named um, William Ripple. Was it Ripple? I'm sorry. I have to look at my notes again. Ruppel. This was literally the last lead I found before literally resources just dried up. They were just gone. And there was a guy named William Ruppel who was staying up in Roseburg. Or I guess down in Roseburg, a little bit south of Eugene who apparently was just a nut and he was at this house in Roseburg and he apparently snuck into this room of a girl who lived there and tried to attack her and assault her and claimed that he had recently killed a woman and a little girl and that he'd kill her if she opened her mouth about it. So of course we have a guy attacking a woman who says he killed a little girl and immediately you know he becomes another suspect 
and of course he quickly changed his tune um, once authorities got him and I think it was deemed that he, he, he wasn't in Eugene at the time either so you know just another case where all these potential suspects they came and then they dried up and were gone but something that was very interesting and now I'm transitioning more into what I think happened is right at about the same time um, you know while several weeks after the murder occurred there were two things that popped up in newspapers and popped up out of nowhere now one thing that was a place of contention was there was claims that Mildred Green had also been sexually assaulted when she was killed and if that if that which is bizarre because again you know when it was discovered her bedding wasn't even messed up but she was on the bed so if she had been sexually assaulted a disgusting thought to think about but somebody would have been on that bed with her and you know the blankets would have been messed up they would have been in some disarray and they weren't so you know it was a hard thing to believe to think that that happened I mean it's hard to think about in general but it's hard to think that that happened and the bedspread didn't even get messed up and so it started popping up in newspapers that she had not she had not been sexually assaulted that was an erroneous statement and the spreading of that claim that she had been sexually assaulted was just some sick thing perpetrated by some twisted local residents like it was just a rumor going around well I read the newspapers and there are quotes from the district attorney district attorney Bryson there are quotes from physicians who did who worked on the autopsy the people who were directly involved who were quoted in multiple different newspapers by multiple different writers as saying it was definitive that Mildred Green had been sexually assaulted when she died. This wasn't just random rumors. This was reputable people printed in newspapers. It wasn't just a rumor going around. So why they all of a sudden backtracked on that thing that had been getting printed frequently and why they tried to act like it was nothing more than a rumor is really bizarre. And right at that exact same time, there was a piece posted that said, you know, there's also rumors going around that Reverend Green, the father, um, has made a full confession that he is the killer. That is also unverified and unfounding, and that is the subject of just inappropriate, disgusting rumor. Both those claims came out of nowhere at the exact same time and it looked to me a little bit like they were trying to protect the father who was a reverend again this is where I'm probably gonna start pissing some religious people off but just because you have a religious title or you subscribe to a certain religion or call yourself a Christian how many times have we seen people do things in the name of God that were disgusting need I bring up unfortunately uh, the priest pedophilia problem that has been going on for how long that the church has tried to claim is not an issue to you know protect themselves what I'm getting at is I now again this is my theory this is not I'm stating this is fact and I guarantee you and if you try to argue with me otherwise I will tear you down no this is my theory I think that the Reverend killed his daughter and that's a, that's a rough thing to have to say, but that is my perspective. That is my theory. That is what I think happened. And I find it very interesting that as time went by and suspects weren't panning out, that all of a sudden the newspaper had to go out of their way to say something that I don't even know if there was actual rumors going around claiming that the Reverend had made a confession, but they had to come out and say, oh, by the way, in case anybody's wondering, he hasn't confessed to the murder. Well, why even bring it up if it isn't even getting reported anywhere? And why are you also suddenly now claiming that the girl wasn't sexually assaulted? Is it possible because you're trying to... Now, I don't know if she was sexually assaulted. I don't, I don't know that angle. And it's disgusting to me to think that a reverend, a man of the cloth, would sexually assault his daughter and then murder her. But I think he's guilty. And it's because of the evidence of the situation. It doesn't have to do with the emotion, because you think, how could a, a, a devoutly religious man murder his daughter in such a way, and it's obvious it wasn't an accident. This isn't like he bumped into her and she fell downstairs and broke her neck and died. This was a murder. Um, 
and you know by all accounts the you know the reverend and mildred were living alone and they were happy together well by all accounts by all whose accounts when all these newspapers i read the only accounts that said that were the reverend's accounts and this is what i find interesting is a year about a year before this all happened the greens were a big family and then the reverend's wife died and then only about a month i think maybe even less than a month before mildred green was killed she had multiple siblings who were living in the house too they traveled east to iowa to visit family and it was like a really long-term vacation they were going to be gone for a long time so this was a big family and then within a couple of weeks of it becoming just the reverend and his daughter she suddenly turns up dead and you know need i you know again i don't know i didn't know reverend green personally i don't know much about this guy but i know that there's such a thing as religious zealots who do absolutely insane things and have completely destroyed the minds of those around them ed gein you know one of the reasons he became the way he was was because he had a religious zealot for a mother that controlled him entirely some people theorize Ed Gein killed his own brother simply because his brother was starting to dismiss the things that the mom was saying. Now, obviously, that's a whole other case and a whole... I'm not getting to the whole Ed Gein thing. But we don't know anything about this reverend. We don't know what kind of skeletons he may have had in his closet. And I find it very interesting. Now, obviously, anybody whose child dies, in the immediate aftermath, they are going to behave incoherently. It's because they're experiencing a pain that no human being should ever have to experience. However, even in the vein that, you know, we all grieve differently, that's an understood thing, there's still kind of a commonality between the grieving of parents who genuinely lost their children by means that were not of their own creation. And it's, you know, there'll be a lot of, you know, crying there'll be a lot of you know kind of solemn behavior you might just sit by yourself and just be like just in a state of shock just you know, this isn't real this can't be happening you can even get erratic and start you know screaming and yelling because you don't understand why this happened why something so horrible had to happen to you there's various different things you go to and by all accounts mr uh, reverend green's behavior was just beyond strange and it came off not so much as one of a grieving father but rather one of someone riddled with guilt and i know religious people can feel a great deal of guilt i've 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 been to church i've been um uh, i've been knighted by the church i've you know taken communion i've done all that stuff and Local, local bystanders said that the Reverend Green's behavior was so bizarre that some of them felt he was going to kill himself, which, I mean, you know, some people have done that over their children, but they said that they didn't fear for his own safety so much as theirs. They said that he was acting so erratically that it made them fear for their own safety in relation to him. They felt like he might endanger them which is not exactly normal for a grieving parent unless you do something to piss them off or unless you're the one responsible for the death of their child. But what I'm talking about right now, this is just me trying to lay the groundwork to, to explain how someone, a man of the cloth, might be capable of doing something like this. This is just trying to explain it in a way. Now, we have to understand, you know, things are a little bit different now, but back in the day, you did not call a man of the cloth into question. You did not question anything about a reverend. A reverend or, you know, anybody like that was, you know, a, had a direct connection to God, and you did not question anything about him. And nobody ever remotely considered the possibility, unless it was absolutely beyond all doubt true, you could prove it, nobody ever would ever, ever in that time and place consider the idea that a reverend, a man of God, would do something like this to anybody, much less his daughter. But you have to remember again how much more zealous a lot, you know, a lot of religious households, they, they were, it was founded on, you know, aggression and authoritarianism in a lot of cases. You know, 
What if Mildred came home and said, a boy kissed me, I'm starting to, or, you know, I think I have a boyfriend now, or could, could have done any number of things that her father would have deemed a sin, you know? Um, about seven years after this case, there was a guy named Thomas Edwards in Portland. I did a Historic Murders of Portland episode on him. In 1919, this guy was a devoutly religious man. And one morning at breakfast, his wife came into the room and he shot his wife to death, went and called the authorities. I think he called his brother, told him what he had done, sat down next to his wife and shot himself to death. So, trust me, and this is, you know, in the same decade as Mildred Green, religious people, or at least people that have claimed to be religious, have done crazy, out-of-character things. Um... And so, while it's really hard to wrap your mind around the idea that this would have happened, or that this could have happened, and while there isn't necessarily, I'll admit right now, there isn't necessarily even evidence to suggest that nobody can say for certain that there was a problem, um, that there was any struggles going on between Reverend Green and his daughter. But, you know, they stuck to themselves a lot. They were homebodies together. They, you know, even Reverend Green said they spent all their time together. So, you know, how can people say exactly where their relationship dynamic was at when she died? And that's all sideshow stuff. What it really comes down to is what we know about the crime itself and what Reverend Green said. Reverend Green said they went to bed at 10 p.m. That was when they went to bed. Um... It was reported that there was like some local children visiting there. There was, you know, locals in the area. And they said Reverend Green and Mildred didn't go to bed till midnight. And I'm sorry, you don't confuse 10 p.m. with midnight unless you have no remote concept of time. Reverend Green says he woke up at 6.30. Locals said they saw him waking up, starting to do stuff outside, getting the laundry ready and all that by 5 a.m. So why is he misrepresenting the time that things happen and when his daughter specifically said wake me up for this why did he suddenly let her sleep in you know parents weren't as lackadaisical i'm sorry to say as they are now back then you put your kids to work back then especially if you were a god-fearing family so it's very interesting to me that this night of all nights he decides to let his daughter sleep in and it's said that even pretty much at the base of the stairs you could look up and see into her bedroom and he said he barely even had to take a step or two up the steps before he could look into the room, see the blood on there, and go, oh my god, something's happened. And here this guy wakes up as early as 5. He doesn't go and check, actually check on Mildred till 8. Three-hour period, he's wandering around the house, and he doesn't once look up there. Because that's all it would have taken for him to notice something was wrong. And all that time, he not once glanced up there. So he lied about the times that he went to sleep, the times that they went to sleep. He lied about when he woke up. It's strange that he wouldn't wake her up when she wanted to be woken up, when parents usually, you know, they didn't care, you know, whether the kids wanted to wake up or not. You wake up and do your work. That's how, how things were. And he not once catches a glance into her room, which the door was over, the door was left open, so he could have seen into her room. But here's the thing. We have a murder case where it is presumed a outside perpetrator got into the house. We have no proof that Mildred went outside and accidentally left the door unlocked like the Reverend said she may have. We have no proof that she did that regularly aside from what he says. And by all accounts, that back door should have been locked. Both of them should have been locked and yet a perpetrator was able to get in without doing any forcible entry. There's no evidence whatsoever that anybody else went into their house. There was not one single fingerprint found. There was no feet imprints from shoes that were not Mildred's or her father's. There was, again, the bedspread wasn't even as disturbed. How does someone go into a bedroom, slit someone's throat, in, in a way like that and not remotely mess up the bed and how does a perpetrator go into a house that small go up sneak in go up the stairs that are directly next to the reverend's room doesn't hear that person in their room doesn't hear the person fleeing because the person would have been fleeing
And there's no, no eyewitness to actually see anybody going in or leaving the house. You can say what you want about seeing this guy running down the street at this area at this time or that person running down the street at that time. Those people are not verifiably tied to having left that specific house. There was no proof that anybody went into that house. And that is, I'm sorry to say, impossible in a crime of this nature. If it's impossible for someone to pull something like that off today, it's particularly impossible for someone to pull it off way back then when, you know, everything was considerably more primitive. I mean, there were obviously, there was no signs of a struggle whatsoever, which likely in that happening, Mildred Green would have been roused from her sleep and then struggled and died, which would have made sounds. And she wouldn't have, you know, unless the perpetrator stayed there and like held her down, she likely wouldn't have been found dead lying flat on her bed like, you know, any random person. The police also in the immediate aftermath brought bloodhounds in to try to track the scent of the perpetrator. And when these bloodhounds were brought to the house, the furthest they went from it was, what was it, 35 feet from the house. Whenever they tried to get the bloodhounds to pick up the scent of the killer, they only went a short distance from the house and oftentimes turned right around and walked right back into the house. It was obvious that whatever scent they were looking for, it was keeping them on that property and leading them back into the house. So if it wasn't Reverend Green that they were theoretically tracking, then whoever was doing the killing, I guess, was hiding under the house at that time. So just, just by all accounts... This murder showed that it was it was done from the inside because, yeah, if you're looking for evidence of another person coming in and you don't find any, well, you're not looking at Reverend Green, the great local reverend. You're not looking at him as a suspect. So if there are fingerprints of his in her room, those aren't going to be scrutinized. If there's, you know, prints going out, if he's got fingerprints all over the back door showing that it was open, those aren't going to be scrutinized. And it would make sense. I mean, it would make sense that he would have fingerprints all over his own home. But that's the thing, is that, you know, the way that this crime went down, everything goes out and turns around and goes right back at somebody, you know, in that, in that house who is, at the end of the day, Reverend Green. That is the only way you have a case happen like this that is so perfect that there's nothing be left behind because the only evidence of the actual killer is evidence you're not looking for because you're not suspecting the reverend you know and he could do that he could straighten out you know the blankets on her bed to make it look you know if he you know if he climbed up onto the bed and slit her throat and the bed's all messed up you know that could look bad for him so he straightens it all up he makes sure he's doing things like doing the laundry, going out and checking the animals. He looks like he looks like he's just going about his normal day. Why does he say he went to bed when he went to bed? Won't go to, why does he say he went to bed at ten when he went to bed at midnight? Why does he say he got up at six thirty when locals say it was as early as five a.m.? Why? Why? Why does? Why is everything he says either a lie or doesn't make any sense? And there's just there's no proof that anybody besides him really even could be guilty of this murder unless they were the luckiest killer in history and pulled off what is essentially a miracle of criminal proportions. And, I mean, you can go on. Uh, the reverend says he found the back door open and there was a bucket put there, like, to keep the door open while the killer got in. Was that bucket checked for prints? I would think so. And nobody, no suspicious prints were found on it? How is that possible? And one of the most interesting things, when you slit someone's throat, it's a fairly quick death and blood sp spritzes out. Yet, with the exception of the bed, there was not one drop of blood found anywhere else other than the bed that Mildred Green was on. There was no blood found on the floor of her room. There was no blood found out in the hallway going down the stairs, going to the back door. There was no blood found out behind their home. When you commit a murder like that, where you slit the throat, blood starts gushing out. Whoever, whoever was the perpetrator of that would have gotten some blood on them. There would have been at least a few drops spread somewhere else. However, if the reverend did it, he would have time to clean things up best he could. I don't know if they had wood floors. They probably had wood floors, which are a lot easier to clean up than, say, carpeted floors. But if he kills her at about, you know, they predict she was killed at about 4 a.m. And he waits till 8 a.m. to 
discover her dead, he has four hours to clean up any blood that might be seen there. He has time to make the scene look immaculate because he almost has to because he can't show his hand. So we're led to believe that some other criminal pulled this miracle off. And it's so funny with, how, you know, all this racism towards black people that they these racist white people would even think a black person would be capable of pulling off such an immaculate crime. It simply doesn't make sense unless, you know, a murder could not come out this perfectly unless you were someone on the inside that had control of the aftermath of that crime scene and could adjust it to make it look any way you wanted to. And as far as I'm concerned, the Reverend did too good of a job cleaning it up, and that was his greatest slip up. I mean, how do you have a murder where not one thing is out of order, a murder that graphic, and nothing is out of order, there's no blood trail, there's nobody in the town heard anything at first, and then, you know, these other stories come out later on, like, what, what makes more sense when all is said and done? Some outside perpetrator with a motive um, that, who knows what motive this person could possibly have, manages to sneak into a home, a small home, not wake up the father sleeping directly beneath the room, commit this horrible killing without waking him up, without spreading any blood, without leaving any fingerprints, any signs that he was ever there. there. There's no proof anybody else was there, even. There's none. And then he sneaks out the back door and doesn't even knock the bucket out of the way to, you know, let the door shut. What's more believable? That someone pulled off a murder that flawless and against <laughs> criminal reason in understanding murder cases, or that a father, for whatever confused, disoriented, twisted reason, ended up killing his own daughter and then had several hours to clean up the crime scene, which, in the end, were left with a crime scene wherein, aside from the murder itself, there's, no, there's nothing to even suggest a crime happened in that house. I feel like the only way that this crime scene could have looked that perfect is if it was cleaned up. And nobody would do that except the father, Reverend Green. So, I think he did it, personally. It's weird, it's twisted, I don't know what would have led things to such a disturbing end like that. Again, his behavior afterwards suggests someone who may have been dealing with some mental illness of some kind. I don't know if there's anything to verify that. But that is unfortunately, you know, as troubling as it is, that is my theory. I don't feel, you know, all the suspects they went after were just, you know, wild and crazy and dismissed pretty quickly. There's some that I'm still a little bit curious about, but not that much. And, you know, the city tried so hard to blame it on a black man. But there's, there's nothing to, to verify that anybody other than the Reverend did this. So black man, white man, doesn't really matter. So it's a really disturbing case um, in terms of racial, racially speaking, but at least the conclusions I've reached on the case, that's what's most disturbing, is that I think this reverend killed his daughter in a very graphic manner. That's where I stand on it. If more information comes out, if anybody finds more information, obviously, you know, my conclusions may stand to be altered. But as far as based on all the stuff I've seen, that's the conclusion I'm brought to. And the fact that the newspapers came out afterwards, almost kind of nothing to instigate it. They immediately came out and were like, oh, by the way, anybody who thinks that the Reverend pleaded, you know, that he did it, um, that, that that was unfounding. That's just a su subject of rumors. Well, how did those rumors get started? You know, if, if Reverends are so well respected, how did that rumor get started? Is it possible that somebody saw something? Uh, somebody heard something, somebody became privy to some information that maybe wasn't supposed to get around. I find it very interesting that that story just came out of nowhere unprovoked, making sure just to say, hey, anybody who's wondering if the dad did it, just don't worry, he didn't, when nobody even asked the question if he did at the time. So it's a story that gives you chills. Anyway, 
thank you so much again for watching another one of these these videos in this series. I try to go, you know, pretty deep and detailed as I can, and I admit sometimes it gets a little bit a little bit dry, but I try to get all the information I can in there. And uh, as always, remember to like, share, subscribe, comment if you so choose. Tell me what you any thoughts you have about it. Um, and hit my Patreon, of course. And all that said, till next time, this has been Steve, the Amateur Historian.